Hello, my name is Bridget Tolley. I'm, um, I'm an Algonquin woman from Kitagon ZV, and my mother was killed in 2001. And um, I've been working on an independent investigation for approximately 10 years now. I'm Kristen Gilchrist, um, non-Indigenous, non-family member, um, allied member of Families of Sisters in Spirit, um, community activist and volunteer. Yeah. So could you speak about what families, the problem that Families of Sisters in Spirit was created about? How it was created? Or no, um, why it was created. What's, what's the problem? What's the overall problem that Families of Sisters in Spirit is addressing? Well, um, there's still women, Indigenous women and girls, who are going missing and murdered every day. Um, so a big problem is the ongoing nature of the violence um, and the, still the lack of arrests and um, general impunity around um, this type of violence. So we exist really to not just draw attention um, to the what we consider epidemic levels of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, um, but to connect family members together um, and create like networks of support and really just building solidarity around this idea um, that families um, know what's best for them, Aboriginal women know what's you know know what needs to be done, and just really listening and supporting um, the voices of those who are most affected. Is that helpful? Yeah, um, and I guess um, can you just give a, a like you said it's an epidemic. Can you just provide some, some sure. background? Sure. Yeah. Um, so it's impossible to know, I'll say, state that up front, um, but going back to the original um, Native Women's Association, Sisters in Spirit, before it began in 2005, um, the estimation was that there were 500 missing and murdered uh, Indigenous women and girls across Canada, and at the time, um, the RCMP said there's there's no way, like I think they you know went on record saying that that number's too high, um, you know, where are you getting this information, and so uh, Sisters in Spirit really set out to just um, just prove that that was you know in existence, um, just to show that actually actually yes RCMP the number is quite high, um, but what even that number of 500 or 582 which is where they stopped counting um, in 2010 I think 2010 yes um, sorry what was my train of thought so even though we have um, that number. Um, they only relied on secondary sources to get that information, right? So it's two staff or a couple of staff, you know, very competent staff, but they were relying only on media reports that existed already. Um, they relied on um, police files that were, you know, public. I don't believe they did any sort of access to information. Um, and through families that came to them. So we know that the media doesn't pay attention, you know, uh, the police aren't really paying attention. So that number is low. And also because there's another um, layer. Um, police jurisdictions across Canada, the RCMP being one of them, doesn't track the ethnic or racial status of victims or offenders for that matter. So, um, you know, some folks will never even be identified. And something else that families have, have mentioned is that um, their loved one's disappearance or murder isn't even, you know, it's not even captured in the information, right? So things like suspicious deaths or women who are found, um, you know, several years after they've gone missing, but they can't you know, a cause of death isn't known. These suspicious deaths, um, you know, the deaths in custody, those certainly aren't being included. Um, a lot of things aren't even counting as violence in the first place. So that, I mean, so we know that, we know that it touches, I would say, every First Nations family in some way. I'm not, not First Nations and, um, you know, Jibbaway family member is also affected by this. So, I mean, even in my own family, um, that's, you know, uh, yeah, families know that it's ongoing, and um, sometimes families will have multiple missing persons or murdered persons in their families, uh, you know, multi-generational. We know that it's, it, so in my mind, that is an epidemic. Yeah, do you have thoughts on why it's an epidemic? Why is there such a big problem? I don't know, I really, um, well, first of all, they say we're not very important. So that's um, one of the reasons why we're, we're, people don't care. We're just, uh, I really don't know. It's really hard to say. And um, it, it's different when an Aboriginal girl is murdered or missing. You know, nobody cares. It seems like um, media doesn't care. We don't, uh, we don't get um, media coverage when this happens. We do our own searches. 
and it, it it's it's I don't know why it it seems like people just don't care about us but we are continuing we are going to continue we, we we have to you know this is why one of the reasons why families the sisters and spirit was made because of this and we have to keep reminding everybody that um, these women are loved and valued and when they're missing, everybody should know they should be treated just like any, any other woman that goes missing. And to get everybody searching, not just the, the families uh, making their own searches, it should be the police, it should be everybody involved. And then the next question is, um, so, what can, so you were just talking about having the police take more of a role and getting the media to cover when people do go missing. Um, are there other things that can be done about this problem? There's a lot of things that need to be done. Um, I think even going to the root causes, we're going you know, back to colonial times, which I think a lot of Canadians want to believe that we're past that and doesn't exist anymore. But um, really, I mean, it's the treatment of Aboriginal women is rooted in, you know, in violence and discrimination and um, misrepresentation and violation and exploitation, all of those things. Um, so, I mean, really think that essentially systemic continuing for years has been um, the cause. But getting to the, I mean, to actually addressing it, there's so many things. Um, but for me, what's really important is uh, the families, right? So bringing families together and allowing them to decide um, what they need, in what way, how others can support them. Because right now, I mean, we have a federal government that's saying we're dealing with it, you know, that's it. Um, you know, a lot of the police um, will, will deny racism exists right off the bat, even when families mention or, um, or classism or things like that will be um, erased right away. So I really think it's like digging at that, that belief that First of all, Aboriginal women aren't loved and valued, and secondly, that we don't have to, you know, when something happens, we don't have to act. So for me, it's about um, communicating and solidarity and building relationships with those most affected um, as a starting point, I think, towards like decolonization and, and um, what needs to be done to end violence. And you know what, there's so many families um, on reserves, um, some of the, the there's a lot of children or teenagers don't even get to come to the city often and even um, not a reserve not that's not too far away from me reserves you know they don't even have running water or bathrooms and and things like this and I think everybody should have that in Canada and why these people don't have bathrooms or running water in their houses, it's really unacceptable and we have to do better than that. I mean, this is our own country of Canada and people, everybody deserves a right to education, to, to water, to everything, just like everybody else. And this is one of the problems that Aboriginal women are facing when on a reserve and to imagine them coming to a city to try and better themselves or, or whatever it is uh, and this is hard for them it's a culture shock for them imagine not having a bathroom then coming to the city and saying oh you know seeing everything that's modernized today how can this be we're living in 2012 right now this is not fair and all these children imagine the children growing up in these families with no water or no running running water or a bathroom in the year 2012 this is like so unacceptable and and this is a problem and it needs to be changed and we have to work with communities like this and families so they can so, so we can show them, you know, that they need help. We need help, and and um, it's important that that, um, that we do everything we can to help these families, even to change to to for school for everything. And this is why a lot of women do go missing. I think is because when they come to the city, there's they they don't know what to do or where to go, and and you know. I even had um, one of the girls, um, one of the teenagers from my reserve, um, Kate, just started school down here at a college, and um, she, she thought it was like so big, you know. And my reserve, we're lucky, we do have everything. We have running water in our houses, we have bathrooms. And still, for this young teenager to move to the city, 
to, to, to come to this big giant school which she's never been in, you know, and, and she was crying, this girl. She didn't know what to do, you know. She didn't want to go to class. It was so big. So, you know, this is a shock to them. And for these children that never come, get a chance to even come to the city, my goodness sakes, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, you know. And things like this have to change for us and for our children so we can have a better education and for them to be healthy. We need, we need, we need to change. Yeah. Can you talk about how Families of Sisters and Spirit got started? Well, Families of Sisters um, got started in 2011, approximately, after the government took away the funding from NWAC's Sisters and Spirit Initiative. They shut it down, so I didn't think it was fair for the government just to bring us all together. And we were bringing so much awareness with it, uh, even with the vigils. We started in 2006 with our first vigil, and we had 11 cities um, across Canada with us that the first year. And in 2010, when the government took away the funding from um, the Sisters in Spirit Initiative, we were landed at almost a hundred vigils across Canada. So there was so much awareness we were bringing. And to just stop them, I didn't think it was fair for the government just to just take, take, take it away from us. So I thought it was important not only for us, but for our Sisters in Spirit and for our families to continue this. So we started as families of Sisters in Spirit to make sure that the families were not forgotten and to, to, to make sure that our sisters in spirit were, we were still going to honor and remember them, even though the government was trying to close the book on that chapter. I, I just wasn't ready. After 10 years of fighting for justice for my mother, even my justice is not over. My, my journey is not over for her. So I, I'm not ready, you know, I'm still, and more families need to be helped. And um, the, the more families we can help, the better, the better it is for us. And I know personally that I might never see justice, but just helping these families not go through what I went through, all the years of looking for justice and uh, limitations on the time limitations, statute of limitations on times and stuff like this. It's very important that a family knows all this. And when you don't have help doing it yourself, you lose all this. And this is what happened in my mother's case because I didn't know you know, about the statute of limitations and we only have so much time to do this and that. So I think it's important that as soon as we can get involved in a case that we go further and help this family and to get the information that they need to continue their their cases. And this is why we had to continue Families of Sisters in Spirit. Not only that, uh, you know, we can't call our vigils evidence to action vigils or anything. They are our sisters in spirit. Whether anybody likes it or not, then we're going to continue. They're going to continue to be our sisters in spirit no matter what. And it was very important for me to make sure that they are always remembered. And um, we're going to keep on doing this till. We can't do it no more. And you were talking before about um, you're not funded by the government and you're very grassroots organization. So why is that important? Well, it's important because um, it gives the families a voice. We can say what, what we want to say. Um, when you have government funding, it, it, it's really hard because um, some stuff you can't say. And uh, Families of Sisters in Spirit is here to give the families a voice. And it's important that the families are heard. And this is why we want to continue this, to make sure that, um, you know, they have a voice. Other than that, uh, we have no voice on our own. And, to, you know, when you get government funding, it's like they can only say certain things. and. You know, you can't say anything bad about this group or this one, but it's not like that. We are families. We continue to look for justice seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You know, some of us are looking for that. And our justice doesn't stop, you know. 
it doesn't matter who gets funding or when they're getting funding. You know, my journey continues even if the, the government doesn't give funding to anybody. My journey still continues. I'm still looking for that justice. And the same with other families. So it's important for us to move forward as a grassroots, nonprofit organization, helping families with what they need when something happens right away, like posters, like um, searching gas money to search or water, anything like this. It's important that we do it right away and not wait for anybody else, you know. The sooner we get the word out, we might bring home somebody or she might be found or whatever the case may be. So we have to do this. And like we can't wait for, you know, organizations to say, oh, well, we'll do this tomorrow or the day after. It's now. And, you know, it's important that we support each other. I know it's very hard. After 10 years of looking for justice for my own mother and my own case, it's very hard for a family to, to, to be doing this all alone. And it feels so good to, to help a family and to see that, you know, at least we're doing something. It's really hard sometimes because we're so far away, like from Ottawa to Winnipeg, you know, you feel like you can't do much, but if you can send $20 for a poster or something like this, you know, at least, you know, inside in your heart, you feel like you're doing something. And you know, you. I wish I was there. I wish I can go search in Winnipeg for for the missing women. You know, but I, I can't just get up and go since I lived in the east in Ottawa. It's kind of far. So you know, any little thing we can do, just saying, oh, we're with you. We support you. Is there anything we can do for you? You know, this is important for the families, and and this is what they need is support right away. So this is what we are trying to do as families, as sisters in spirit. And we actually did find a few girls, which was so nice, you know, and it feels so good to, for, for them to say, okay, we're home, you know, because most of the time we do not get this. They're, they're, they're not found. So the one or two or three that we do bring home, thank goodness that we had a chance to, to be a part of helping bring them home. So it really feels good and it makes the family feel good. I know this because uh, for the first few years I was alone on my journey when I was searching and um, doing everything in Quebec because I didn't know what to do. It was with the police and everything. And again, the police is a big part of the problem, you know, and this is why it's important for families to help families because, um, like I said, the police is a part of the problem and um, there's so much problems. And this is why we need to make sure that these families are supported right away as soon as something happens. Um, I guess you were talking about the families having a voice as well. And so there's, a, and you mentioned a bit about the vigils, but there's two vigils in, <coughs> in the year. There's the one that's coming up shortly, the October 4th, and also February 14th. So can you just talk about those vigils? Yeah, sure. So. Um when Sisters in Spirit was still running and, and open, uh, annual vigils were held. And as Bridget said, even when the funding went, communities continued to, to hold vigils on October 4th, um, which was the anniversary of Amnesty International's Stolen Sisters Report in 2004, and also um, a day before Bridget's mother was killed in 2001. Um, so we, um, our big goal is, again, is to bring families in. So what we like to do is we host um, you know, panels, discussions, vigils, rallies, feasts, any number of things that we can do um, and, and support families in coming, right? So I think Bridget mentioned we have, um, for this October 4th vigil, um, on Parliament Hill in Ottawa, unceded Algonquin Territory, at 6.15 we will have families represented from um, Vancouver, the downtown east side, the Highway of Tears, um, cases from Edmonton, families from Winnipeg, um, Thunder Bay, Toronto, Kitchener, as much as we can. So we're bringing in probably in Quebec probably 15 or so um, families. And so we've invited them to, you know, go on the hill and say what they want to say, which is, you know, quite rare. Even at events like this, usually there's, um, you know, leadership talks for a long time, and then there's some politicians that say, you know, we're on board, we're on side. But I think really the change will come when people actually start listening and hearing the stories. So 
being able to bring in, you know, 15 families is really powerful, and so um, we continue to do that. And we actually have had success in having this October 4th declared Families of Sisters in Spirit Day by the City of Ottawa and um, the mayor. So that's great. And um, yeah, so, and on the 14th, it's, um, it's a day of justice. Um, you know, it's, it's in support of events that have been happening across Canada for 20 years. Like um, the downtown east side has been holding theirs for 20, since, the, since 1991, I believe. So it's February 14th? Yes, yeah. so February 14th, yeah, it's like a day of action. And, um, and again, we bring families in and, and do our best to connect them up. Sometimes they would like to meet with MPs, so we, we do our best to, to work that out. Um, generally, it's NDP and, and, uh, liberals. and liberals only. But, um, or if they want, you know, really just letting them know what they need um, and how we can help them. So, yeah. But it's all about bringing the families in and making sure they have a space carved out for them to say what they need to say in the way they want to say it. Um, again, without fear of, you know, you know, uh, going against a funding agreement or losing your job or any of those other things that we find constrain this type of, this type of work. So yes, October 4th and February 14th are the Families of Sisters in Spirit uh, main organizing days. Yes. And like you said, these are both like bigger than just Ottawa. They're... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, every single one of them um, is not confined to Ottawa. I mean, there are, even in um, the vigils this year, uh, they've, I don't know if, how many international, but in the past they've had like Nicaragua and like America and different, um, different states who are actually standing in solidarity as well. And yeah, Ottawa is not the only place. Um, Thankfully, it's all over. I mean, there are pockets across Canada of really great grassroots, um, community-led, family-led work. And so we're sort of just, you know, in support of that as well and doing what we can. These vigils are happening all across Canada and, like I said, internationally. I think there's over 120 this year. So, you know, we're, we're getting there and, it, you know, we're not going to go away. We want to continue to remember and honor these women and like Kristen says, it's a place for the families to have a voice and um, it's important that they share their stories and this is the one day when we honor and remember our sisters. So October 4th was the day we chose for this and um, we want to continue this every year. So it, we will continue it. It's our second um, Families of Sisters in Spirit uh, vigil this year. Yeah. So um, we want to continue it and yeah. we're looking forward to having many, many more. We want to continue. Like I said, we're grassroots, we're a um, non-profit, we accept donations, um, everything goes back to the families. I mean, we, we help even um, if it's not October 4th, we help families with having vigils in their own town and, you know, family vigils like the Tanya Nipanak I just had a vigil on September 13th in Winnipeg. Um, so um, we send, you know, a 50 bucks, 100 bucks to help out with that vigil for food or, or gas or water or whatever, whatever it is, you know. Not only that, on October 2nd of this year, they are going to be looking for Tanya Nipanak's body at the um, landfill in Winnipeg. So we're asking everybody, you know, whoever can go help out in the search, you know, please do. I mean, this family, we have to bring this, this girl home. It's very important. Winter is coming on, and um, we don't want to see another winter pass when, especially when the girl, the Tanya, is not down. It's really important for us and for that family to, to do everything possible to, before winter to find her. So we have a pretty good idea of where she is. She is at the landfill. That's you know that's what the what the police say. So you know the sooner we start looking for her, the better. And this is one thing you know, like we try and help out even for for the Tanya Nipanak search. We ask for volunteers to help search. You know, so this is little things we can do. Any little thing we can do, we are here. We are Families of Sisters in Spirit. If anybody wants to contact us, you can contact us at familiesofsistersinspirit at gmail.com. Um, if there's any, anybody that has any family members that um, 
they would like to let us know about. It doesn't matter how old the, the case is, uh, 20, 30 years old, we're, we're going to be happy to listen to any family members. So we're hoping to um, start the database, to working on the database, continue the database as of um, since the NWAC left off, maybe starting in 2010, going onwards. So we're looking at a few other things in the future to, 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 to make sure that um, we know who's missing and from where. So that'll be um, more work for us to do, but we're looking forward to helping a lot of families and new families and doing whatever we can to help everyone. Thanks. Is there any other thoughts that you'd like to... Um, no, I think we... Um, I'll just add also, so um, October 4th is a, is a day of mourning and remembrance, which we think is very, very important to honor those have been, who've been lost. Um, and February 14th we see more as a rallying call and really about changing the conditions which create this violence because, um, you know, it continues and, and you know, poverty and racism and colonialism and discrimination and, um, you know, lack of education, all of those things happen year-round. And we really want to be um, acting so that we can prevent, right, so supporting the people who are still living and improving their, um, their conditions. So, yeah, so we are... You know, find it very important to remember, but we're also very action-oriented as well. And um, we're on Facebook. We're very heavily involved with Facebook. Um, we have several groups, but uh, the main one is Families of Sisters in Spirit. It's a community page. And also Missing and Murdered Aboriginal Women in Canada is another um, way to get in contact with us. And even to follow what we're doing or to, to see cases that are already um, posted or really any, you know, it's really just a clearinghouse of information and, and others share with us and across Canada. So... Facebook us. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.